you can experience Acts chapter 2. Hi, welcome to today's little lesson and thank you so very much for joining me once again as we continue our journey through the book of Acts verse by verse. And today, in this episode, we're launching off into Acts chapter 2, which has got to be one of the most exciting chapters in the New Testament because it tells an amazing story and we're not just interested in it from a historic or academic standpoint. We want to see how it can impact our lives because uh, the scriptural evidence points to the fact that we can also experience the same thing that the early believers, the 11 apostles, plus the new replacement apostle, plus Jesus's brothers, plus Mary, the mother of Jesus, plus the other women who are always following Jesus around and so forth, about 120 people together on the day of Pentecost, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the scriptural evidence, uh, the, the preponderance of the scriptural evidence indicates that that's was not just a unique event in church history, but we see other cases in the book of Acts of other times where other disciples and followers of Jesus Christ were baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit, just like on the day of Pentecost, which we're going to be reading about today. Okay, so I'm interested in this because I want to experience it. And actually, I already have experienced it. Okay, so now I want you to experience it. If you'll stick with me and pay attention and keep your heart and your mind open, I guarantee you 100% that you can. And therefore, if you will believe, you will experience what these 120 folks 2,000 years ago experienced in what we think was the upper room, we call the upper room, and, um, it, you know, it could happen to you. And for the same reason and for the same benefit, okay, so this is super duper duper exciting. Now, we already know from, we've already covered, but I just want to bring you up to date. Of course, um, Jesus was crucified during the Passover. That's in the, the springtime always in the spring when we, of course, you know, celebrate uh, what we call the Christian holiday of Easter. And then uh, Jesus appeared after his resurrection three days later over a period of 40 days. We already read that. And you can read of quite a few of Jesus's post-resurrection appearances uh, in, you know, the Gospels, as well as in the, the book of Acts. In fact, we already read Jesus' promise in Acts chapter 1 in one of those uh, post-resurrection appearances. It seems like it was the last one, so it would have been 40 days after um, his crucifixion. He said to, his, to, to, to the 11, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Okay, so he told him to wait in Jerusalem until they were clothed with that power. And he said, you'll be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So the reason that Jesus wanted to empower the 11 was to empower them to take the gospel locally, regionally, and then worldwide. And that's exactly what happened. Because if God equips you, you're, you're, you're equipped. <laughs> All right. So we're going to read about uh, that event. Um, it happened on the day of Pentecost, which that would be 50 days after um, the Passover uh, Passover feast. Of course, there were three annual pilgrimage festivals that all you know, Jewish men were required to journey to Jerusalem three times a year and appear before the Lord there, <laughs> okay? And two of those festivals were in the spring, Passover and Pentecost, that's what we call it, because um, it's Penta, 50 days after the Passover. One of them, of course, was um, in, the, uh, in, in, in the fall. <clears throat> But the two in the spring were separated by 50 days. And so you can imagine that if 
people traveled a long distance to get to Jerusalem for the Passover, which, which was a time when Jerusalem would be swelling with, with pilgrims and so forth, coming from all over, really the known world at that point in time. Uh, some of them would have had to travel a quite a long journey of, of uh, a week or two weeks, you know, in order to get there. Some had to take boats <laughs> to get there, you know, because they were on like the island of Crete and take a boat over to, to you know, to get to Jerusalem. Um, and, and you can understand that if 50 days later they're going to be required to come back again, the people who uh, came long distances would probably just stay. Right? You know, no sense traveling two weeks to get to Jerusalem and then traveling two weeks to get back home. And then you could, you're only home for, you know, a, a week or so. And, and then you've got to make another two week journey back to Jerusalem. So you, you just would have stayed there. Okay? We're going to read about how people were staying in Jerusalem and they happened to be there on the day of Pentecost. Okay? Interesting stuff. And this is exciting because we're going to apply it to us. Verse number one of Acts chapter two, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Doesn't specify that place, but they had been devoting themselves to prayer in, in, in an upper room. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. So think, you know, maybe not hurricane tornado type sound, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> approaching, you know, that, that kind of a sound. You've heard, a, you know, a, a violent rushing wind before. It's a bit scary, but it's sending a message to them. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And that sound, that noise filled the whole house where they were sitting. And so, it was a, a sound, but not necessarily a phenomena of wind. It was the sound of a violent rushing wind, a noise, uh, it's called in the New American Standard. And it, that sound, filled the whole house where they were sitting. Uh, so we don't have to necessarily imagine, you know, that papers were flying everywhere and their hair was being blown all over the place and there was a tornado in the upper room, although there may have been. It just doesn't say, and we don't want to make that assumption. And, and, but, but this is supernatural. This is a sovereign, divine, miraculous act of God, not as a result of any human uh, part. This is God sending the Holy Spirit down upon the 120. And, and, and beyond that element of the supernatural, there appeared to them tongues as a fire. So appeared to them. So we shouldn't assume that there were actual literal flames of tongues of fire uh, above them, uh, but that they were seeing into the spiritual realm. In fact, even the sound may have been just produced in the spiritual realm and their, eye, or their ears rather were opened to hear it. You know, there is a spiritual gift, one of the nine spiritual gifts uh, that Paul lists in 1 Corinthians called the discerning of spirits. And we'll study that as we work our way through the, the book of Acts and see examples of it. But any kind of a vision or any kind of a contact with the spiritual world is a discerning of spirits. So if you saw into the spiritual world right now, you might see an angel. You could maybe see demons. Of course, God is a spirit. G Jesus said, we are spirit, spirit, soul, and body. So if you saw in the spiritual realm, you would still see the, you'd see the spirits of people. And so it is possible that God allowed them to hear into the spiritual realm so that there you know, actually wasn't an actual wind and see into the spiritual realm so there wasn't actually you know, visible tongues of fire upon them, but that they were visible to them by virtue of the gift of discerning of spirits where they're all permitted to see into the spiritual realm. I don't know. I'm just speculating at this point. But these tongues of fire distributed themselves and they rested on each one. So it's like the ball of fire, maybe, you know, and then, then spreading out and fire above each one. Now, I want to say, before I forget to say, that if in fact there were the 120 there that are mentioned in Acts chapter 1, it included women who were waiting for the Holy Spirit right along with the men. Jesus's mother Mary was there, you know, at this time, waiting for the 
Holy Spirit to come. And why was the Holy Spirit given? He was given to empower them to take the gospel locally, regionally, and to the world. And there were women just as much as there were men who were waiting and who were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They heard the mighty rushing wind, the tongues of fire distributed itself, rested on each one of them. That leads us to believe that the men and the women had these tongues of fire on top of them. And so women were baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Why am I saying that? Well, I'm sure you can probably figure out that I'm trying to give a plug for the fact that women are co-heirs with the men in the redemption, which is in Christ. And God uses them and wants to use them, maybe not always as spectacularly and to uh, the quantitative uh, uh, amount that he, God you know, generally uses men, but God can use any woman that he wants to. And there were women in that room that no doubt God used in a powerful way uh, as a consequence of them being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And if you study church history, you can find some great examples of women whom God used. Okay, so don't close your mind to women just because, you know, uh, some, God anoints, you know, a female vessel. That's his business and uh, let's not fight it. You say, well, what about those scriptures that don't allow, you know, uh, women to teach men? Well, that's another subject, okay? And uh, I, you know, I don't want to follow that rabbit trail right now. But we have to harmonize all of Scripture, okay? So, you know, women shouldn't teach men, okay? Then how come then Jesus uh, told women to go tell Peter and the rest of the apostles that he had been resurrected? He was giving them information to give to apostles, no, no less. He gave it to women. The women were the first bringers of the good news, the first preachers, as it were, you know, and preaching to a pretty important audience there, uh, the other apostles who, you know, were, didn't know what to do. The women saw the resurrected Christ first, and Jesus told them to take a message to men, okay? So, great, balance that with what Paul said, figure it out, okay? We, we can figure it out. So, um, and here's what happened, verse number four, and they were all men and women, 120, filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember I said that the Holy Spirit is often spoken of uh, in terms of fluidity. He's poured out and he, people are filled with him. The Holy Spirit's not an it. Holy Spirit's a him, a he. is a person. We say, you know, the, one of the three persons of the Trinity. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and what happened? They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And we'll see very quickly that these were actual languages which they personally had never learned that they were speaking. And what were they speaking? They were speaking about the mighty deeds of God, giving praise to Him. Notice it says, and very importantly, and I, I'm going to spend a little time on this because this is so important, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So, it was them, they, who were filled, but also the, 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 it says they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So they did the speaking. They weren't just overpowered and overcome so that uncontrollably, without any of their own volition, did they speak. No, they did the speaking. The Spirit gave them the utterance. And that's a reason why many genuine Christians have never experienced this, because they stumble over that one point. They pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit, just like the 120, and they have good reason to pray that with faith because this is not the only case of this in, this, in, the, in the book of Acts. Jesus talked about speaking in tongues. He said it's one of the signs that will follow those who believe. Okay, so lots of folks have prayed, but they wait then for the Holy Spirit to overpower them. You know, because you know, they say, well, I don't, I don't want it just to be me. Well, then you, you're, you're thinking wrongly. It's, it, you know, it's good that you think you don't want it to be just you, but you have something to do with speaking in tongues. Every time I speak in tongues, I have something to do with it. But the Holy Spirit has something to do with it as well. He gives the utterance. 
Okay, and you just think about it. I mean, there's, there's so much of life is, is, you know, this is how God works, right? I mean, it's a miracle that I'm talking in English to you. I actually have thoughts in my brain that make some sense, <laughs> you know, and I'm able to think those and simultaneously take them out my mouth and move my mouth in a million different ways, you know, and speak out, you know, somehow sound waves are carried through the air, you know, if, if to, and it's hitting a microphone here in this case. And, and, but, but all that is super duper natural. Nobody can explain how people can talk, right? You can't explain that. that uh, there's a million miracles associated with just speaking in your own language, right? Right. But are you overcome with English and all of a sudden you start saying anything and you have no control over your mouth and your tongue and your lip? No. <laughs> See, watch, I'm going to be quiet. There you go. See? And now, then I, now I started talking. I have something to do with what I talk. But still, I have thoughts in my, in my mind even as I'm being quiet. Let me think about something. Okay, see, I was having thoughts. I could have spoke, but I didn't speak because I, I didn't want to speak. I decided not to speak. Same thing here. Uh, and people stumble over this. Well, you shouldn't stumble because it's this is how God works. He doesn't overpower us, generally speaking. Okay, we we have to cooperate and work with Him, and so the Spirit gives the utterance. You do the speaking, and if you pray to be baptized in the Holy Spirit or fill the Holy Spirit as the 120 were, but you're not willing to speak, well, guess what? You're never going to speak in other tongues, at least, anyways. Okay, you say, well, I don't know how to do it. Well, that, that see, <laughs> it's tons of mystery. It's a miracle, you know. That, they, probably the first time you do it was when it's the most weird. Once you do it once, you can then do it, you know, anytime you want thereafter. And uh, it's up to you now. But the Holy Spirit gives utterance. And it doesn't, the utterance does not come out of your brain where, where thoughts come and where English, if that's what you speak, if that's your language, it comes out. It comes out of your spirit. Paul talks about this. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Okay, so watch. Brestende calarapito otushvarende vacarie pedesombro latambre de shelta carabide nostora. What am I doing? I'm speaking in tongues. I can do that anytime I want to. Ever since I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, like the 20, you know, it's been almost 50 years now for me. Uh, you know, I've done that hundreds of thousands of times. And interestingly enough, it's not necessarily always the same language. <clears throat> it's always interesting. Okay, so I've experienced Acts chapter 2. So can you. What's the requirement? You have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And that's one reason why many people have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet, because they're not really believers in Jesus. Uh, and, and so I, I've watched those people, you know, they stumble over all this stuff. They, well, they say, well, I prayed and I didn't, it didn't happen to me. Well, there's a lot not happened to you because you've never been born again. You, know, you never even experienced the new birth. That's the first work of the Holy Spirit when he comes to indwell you, when you believe in the Lord Jesus. But we have so many people today in churches who, who've accepted Jesus. That's a phrase you won't ever find in the Bible. And it's actually a kind of a heretical concept from one standpoint, because Jesus does not need your acceptance. You know, we need his acceptance. He's the Lord, right? He's the judge. We're going to stand before him. So we want to be accepted by him. He doesn't want to be accepted by us. That's an insult. That's exalting us above him. I accept you, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Where'd that phrase ever come from? I'll tell you where that phrase came from. That phrase came from the heretics who embraced a false grace gospel and couldn't stomach the biblical phrases that are so common, like believe in the Lord Jesus or repent and believe in the Lord Jesus. They couldn't accept that, you know, because that sounds like works to them, to their... Forgive me for being so harsh about this, but, but it just drives me crazy. It's so common. Have you accepted the Lord? Accept, that's like an oxymoron. Accepted the Lord. Lords don't get accepted. <laughs> you know, come on. 
And so if you're not born again, this what I'm talking about has no application to you whatsoever, except the fact that you need to be born again. And once you're born again, once the Holy Spirit indwells you, then you could pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then you know you you would have something supernatural happen to you as well. Now people say, well, well, how come we don't have the tongues of fire, and how come we don't have the mighty rush? Why aren't you telling people that they should expect that too? You know these fundamentalists. They say they believe the Bible. They don't believe the Bible at all. You know. How come we, you know, they, they, they had a mighty rushing wind, they had tongues of fire, and how come, you know, why, why don't you preach that and tell people to expect that? I'll tell you why I don't tell people to expect that, because this is the only place in Scripture where that happened. This is, at this, that, that part of it is indeed a one-time supernatural event. Not that maybe it hasn't happened other times in church history where God sent winds or people heard winds or people people had visions or people saw flames <laughs> you know that probably happened a lot of times in church history but as far as coupling these things all into one package and saying well this is what everyone should suspect that's not scriptural because you can't find another place in the book of acts where there was a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire but you can find a number of places and we'll just come across them in acts where people spoke in tongues Okay, so, so you say, well, that's just for the Pentecostals. No, it's not for just for the Pentecostals. Yeah. It's for anyone who believes the Bible. Okay, all right. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So as I was speaking in tongues just a few minutes ago, that was not coming out of my head. That was coming out of my spirit, and the Spirit was giving me the utterance, but I had to do the speaking. And I can't explain it any more than I can explain that I'm speaking English to you right now. How that is possible that I can speak in English to you right now is an absolute mystery, miracle, divine, off-the-charts miracle. Okay, now verse number five. Let's wind this down. Now, there were Jews living in Jerusalem. I remember I talked about that at the beginning of this episode. Why were there Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven? Because they were hanging around. The bare bones minimum, they were there for the second pilgrimage of the year to Jerusalem, which was uh, Pentecost. They would call it the Feast of the Harvest or the Feast of Weeks, 50 days after the Passover. And a lot of them, I'm assuming, had been living there because they had hung around since Passover. Because why travel all the way back? We're going to see that it came from faraway places. But that helps us see how strategic this is, that it, God sent the Holy Spirit and caused this great miracle on the day of Pentecost, because God wants what the gospel to go to all the nations. And do you think it's possible that any of these folks who were born again on the day of Pentecost, the 3,000 or so souls who were living, from, you know, who were gathered there from all over, you know, the Mediterranean world at that time, you, 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 you think when they went back, they told anybody what happened to them? You see, we have no idea what actually the, the impact of the day of Pentecost, I mean, but it, it had within a short time, no doubt, you know, all, Mediterranean world, at least, impact, okay, and, and Middle Eastern impact. So now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, see, they must have heard it too. The crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. So these were Jews who, you know, didn't take vacations to other places of the world. They were born in those other places of the world, amongst Jewish colonies where Jewish people were, were living. And so they spoke the languages of their nations from which they came. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of them in our own language which we were born? And now he, we begin to enumerate them. Parthians and Medes and Elamites. Well, I happen to know that Elamites, that's another word for Iranians. Elam. Okay, so they were all the way from Iran. Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. I happen to know that Asia is not when we think, you know, we think today of Asia, uh, but think of modern day Turkey. Pergia and Pampilia, uh, Egypt, 
So now we're, you know, in North Africa uh, and, and, and districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, all the way from Italy, both Jews and proselytes, so people who were born Jews and people who had become Jews and were practicing the Jewish faith because they believed in the Jewish God. They were there for the, 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 the second pilgrimage of the year to, to Jerusalem. Cretans, that's from the island of Crete, and Arabs, well, wow, wow, they're scattered all over the place. At least today they are. And we hear them, uh, you know, maybe just the Arabian Peninsula back then. And we hear them in our own tongues. And what were they doing? Were they preaching the gospel in those other languages? They were not preaching the gospel in those other languages. But they were speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Now, all of these people who were present would have been bilingual to at least some degree because all of them, you know, had their native tongue. We just listed the nations from, from, from whence they came, where they lived. But they also would have uh, understood Hebrew and, and uh, you know, at being all Jews and uh, probably Greek. Okay, Peter preached a sermon and we don't know what language it, it was in, but everybody understood it. He would have taken the common language, right? So they can all hear it. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? So some were convinced that it was, you know, a sign from God, something supernatural, divine is happening here. But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. What a stupid observation that was. But, you know, people, doubters are stupid. You know, oh, oh, it, yeah, that, that is what happens when people get drunk. They all supernaturally start speaking languages they never learn. Uh, I, I will say as a little caveat here that, you know, there's no doubt that when this happened, that the, the, the 120 were happy, right? I mean, yeah, they, they, they could have just been solemnly, you know, speaking in tongues as if they were all, you know, at a funeral or something. There had to be some joy. Of course, the Holy Spirit, one of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. You get the Holy Spirit, you're going to get joy. But when this happened, I mean, they had to be looking at each other going, whoa, <laughs> big smiles, you know, raising their hands, praising God, you know, maybe moving a little bit even, you know, and, 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 and that could be the only legitimacy to this ridiculous observation and a conclusion that they are full of sweet wine. They, they've had a little bit too much to drink. And so it's a, it's a little, they're a little bit tipsy here. Yeah, right. That's why they're speaking in languages they never learn. That always happens when people drink wine. <laughs> Okay, now, in conclusion, before, you know, next time we'll go and start in verse number 14, Peter's great, awesome, Holy Spirit-inspired sermon, which we're going to learn some stuff from that, too. But um, why was the Holy Spirit given? It was given to empower the 120 to take the gospel to the whole world. And look, what, what's the sign, the, the, the pervasive sign that he gives them, you know, connected with this baptism of the Holy Spirit? They're speaking in languages of people who live all over the, their known world. See, can you see the, the, how, how smart God is? He doesn't want them to forget. I, I, gave, I gave you this gift so you can take the gospel to people who speak a different language. Not that I'm going to enable you to speak the other language and preach the gospel. That, that's not what happened here. And, and, and I think many quarters of the church today have forgotten that, that you know, if, you're, if you're a Pentecostal or if you're a baptized in the Holy Spirit, anybody other, any other kind of Christian, God did not give you the Holy Spirit so you could go to church and, and laugh, although you might be happier now and full of joy, hopefully, that's a side benefit, but to get involved in taking the gospel around the world. And you should be involved in that on some level. Not necessarily you have to go. God's not necessarily sending everybody. Of course, he's not sending most, most everyone. He's not sending, but he wants everybody involved. And when we speak in other tongues, it should remind us God loves the whole world. Jesus died for the sins of every tongue, tribe, nation, and people, and language. And, and if God's interested in that, we should be interested in that. Supporting missionaries, praying to that end, you know, Praying the Lord would send out labors into his harvest and so forth. Okay, so you got it? All right, this was a good lesson, about 30 minutes. Hope it was worth your time. Hope I'll see you the next time. If you've never visited 
One of my two favorite websites, heavensfamily.org. What are you waiting for? The word heaven, the letter S, the word family. And there you can get involved in taking the gospel to the world and helping people all over the world who are amongst our spiritual family. Okay, until next time, may the Lord keep blessing you.